So I have uh, Dr. Carl Guyberson with me. He is uh, from Gordon uh, College in Boston, although he's moving to Stonehill College, Carl? Yes. Stonehill? Yep. Also in Massachusetts. Uh, also in Massachusetts, but he's written this book, uh, a remarkable book, The Wonder of the Universe, Hints of God, <coughs> excuse me, in our fine-tuned world. And I, I showed you off the top of the show another book that he has uh, co-authored, The Language of Science and Faith. He did this with Francis Collins, who, of course, is uh, world famous as the, what was he, the head, uh, the chairman? What was, what was his he, official he, title? He ran the Human Genome He ran project, the Human right? Genome He had labs project. all over the world working on that. It yeah. was an amazing project. Yeah, and, and now, now what's he up to? He's the uh, head of the National Institutes of Health, uh, running one of the biggest uh, scientific budgets in the world. Yeah, right. How did, how did you link up with Collins? Well, we're fellow uh, evangelical Christians, and uh, I asked him to write a foreword uh, to uh, a book I wrote a few years ago called Saving Darwin, mm -hmm. and uh, he agreed uh, to do that, and he's lent his name to a lot of projects like that, and then when he got interested in starting the BioLogos project, he came to see me in Boston and asked if I would kind of help him with that project that was an attempt to uh, find harmony between uh, faith and science, and, and that book was one of the first projects that we did. Right. Now, before we uh, get, get into a discussion, and by the way, um, after the program, I'm going to interview you again, and we'll run that second interview tomorrow, so we'll have uh, more of you. But uh, I'd like your comment on this. Here's, here's Canada's uh, famous Maclean's magazine, and the title of this week's uh, magazine is This Changes Everything. What are we talking about? We're talking about the Higgs boson. What in the world is a boson? Uh, well, a, a, a boson uh, is a particle, uh, if I give you a short and unhelpful answer, named after an Indian physicist whose last name was Bose. Uh, and all of the particles that physicists study are, uh, are in two groups. Uh, there's bosons and fermions. Uh, the electron is the most familiar example mm. of the fermion. And the most familiar example of the boson is the photon that carries light. Uh, so, uh, in that broad family of particles called the bosons, uh, a new one uh, has been discovered uh, in Europe uh, that was predicted by uh, a physicist named Peter Higgs almost a half century ago. So it was an amazing, extraordinary prediction, and they've looked for it in experiments and accelerators for decades and began to get hints of it uh, a year or two ago and did many, many experiments to make sure the statistics were right and they weren't being fooled, and they're now convinced that they've uh, discovered the boson that Peter Higgs predicted back in the 1960s. And, and this is the uh, catalytic element that uh, creates mass. Yes, it's, it's an answer to a very deep question. I mean, this, the scientific process is all about digging deeper and finding one set of answers and then looking at those answers and saying, but yes, but why are those things true? And then finding an answer to that and then looking beneath that and saying, and why is that true? And one of the deep questions of physics is why do some particles have mass, electrons and uh, protons, for example, and other particles like the photon uh, don't have mass? Uh, so Peter Higgs produced a theory about how mass is kind of uh, picked up by particles as they pass through the Higgs field. Uh, so it's an artifact of their interaction with a field that exists everywhere in space. And uh, this was a, a very interesting theory that kind of rounded out the conventional way of understanding the smallest possible particles. Uh, but nobody knew how to find the Higgs boson. And in particular, we didn't know how much it weighed. Uh, and if you don't know how much something weighs, you don't know how much energy it will take you to make it appear because we're always ruled by E equals MC squared. So if you have to uh, produce something of a certain mass, you need a certain energy. Uh, so they did these very, very high energy experiments uh, in uh, Europe uh, over the past few years and, and sure enough, the Higgs boson has appeared. Yeah, at the Center for uh, Nuclear Energy Research, is that what it's yes, called? Yes, outside it's Outside of Geneva? It's a global collaboration. Uh, uh, the biggest machine in the world. The the, this particle the world. Uh, accelerator. Yep. Um, you know, it's a fascinating story, and I would encourage our, our viewers to, uh, you know, check out on the internet uh, more about the Higgs boson. We could uh, spend a lot of time talking about it. But anyway, and then did you hear about the, the, the report this morning about, it's called uh, BX442, an, a new uh, spiral galaxy that is the oldest galaxy ever seen by the Hubble telescope. 
and everybody's astonished because it has such a beautiful symmetry to it. Did you hear about that? Yeah, no, I haven't heard about that one yet. So well, there you uh, go. Get See? the news here from you this morning. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. It's yeah. amazing what's being discovered out there. I was astonished as I was reading your book, again, as I was the first time I read Cosmos by Carl Sagan, at the um, massive uh, size of the universe. Like, just in terms of our own Milky Way galaxy, we're talking trillions of miles from one side to the other? I mean, we're, we're trillions of miles to the nearest star. To the nearest the star. The nearest star, not the to the other side of the galaxy. Oh, just to, to the, the nearest very star. very nearest star, trillions of miles. Well, as I read your book, I, I felt smaller and smaller and smaller. <laughs> and then when you, when you talked about, yeah. um, uh, I remember Sagan referred to the Earth as an in, insignificant piece of dust on the outer fringes of the Milky Way galaxy. You talk in similar terms. Uh, the Earth is so small, absolutely insignificant in terms of the size of our, just our galaxy. And there's, what, trillions of galaxies out there? Uh, well, billions, billions, for sure. Probably billions? hundreds of billions. Billions? Well, it's... the. Uh, maybe the only petri dish for life that we know of right now. And you call it the Goldilocks uh, planet. Uh, why, do you, why do you choose that term? Well, we now understand uh, how specified and uh, precise the conditions are for life. And you can't just have life anywhere. It's not like Star Trek where you just beam down onto any random planet and it turns out to be something like the Earth with creatures that look something like us there. Uh, things have to be very, very precise and the, the most difficult thing to achieve is liquid water. I mean, we, we think of water as being abundant and familiar. I mean, we're here on the edge of the Great Lakes and so on. I mean, we're surrounded by water on our planet. Uh, but the temperature ranges in the universe go from much, much colder than our planet to much, much hotter than our planet. And so this little range where water is in a liquid form is actually quite unusual. It's a very, very unusual temperature. It, it, it can only exist in this uh, range called the habitable zone uh, at a certain distance from a star. And so if you start asking, well, how, how many places are there gonna be like that? Uh, there's not gonna be, uh, 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 there's not gonna be a, a place like that around every single star. Uh, and we don't know how many stars it, we would have to examine to kind of find one of those places each time. Every so often, we do find a planet that seems to be at the right temperature, and there's always a lot of excitement about that. But all of these news stories about this or that planet that we found might be uh, habitable are all simply discoveries that this planet has liquid water on it. That's, that's basically it. And if it has liquid water, then life could exist there. Uh, but it's, it's quite rare in the universe. When you mentioned that you and Collins are evangelical Christians, um, I w I'm not surprised. Uh, reading what you, I'm reading Collins too, by the way, and I'm uh, fascinated with uh, his writing. But you make a point here, and I'll just find it. Yeah, here it is. That Christianity played a central role in the origin of science. Uh, for a lot of our viewers, that would be a surprise. To, wh wh how is that the case? Uh, well, there's, there's a lot of exploration of that, and it's, it's, it's not an uncontroversial uh, claim. But what we do know is that the, uh, the giants in the history of science, uh, starting uh, perhaps with uh, Copernicus, uh, Galileo, Newton, uh, Kepler, and so on, I mean, they, they were all uh, deeply religious. Uh, uh, Copernicus was a, a canon uh, in, the, in the Catholic Church. Uh, and Newton wrote a lot about biblical studies and prophecy and so on. I mean, he was deeply interested in, uh, in, in spiritual things. He was unconventional uh, in his Christian faith, but, uh, but deeply religious. And, uh, and, and so there's, a, there's, there's a, a, a connection of some sort, uh, uh, I think, between the belief that these uh, early scientists had in the compelling rational character of, of the world. I mean, that, that's a deeply rooted faith that the world isn't just a, a random collection of things that are happening, but rather it has a, a rationality and intelligence behind it. And, uh, and, and I think that that belief in a rational creator plays a role of some sort in, uh, in, in shaping the motivations uh, of the early scientists. And, and, and we shouldn't ignore the fact that, that if it weren't for the church uh, during those long centuries, there would have been no educated populace whatsoever. I mean, it was that the church was what was keeping learning alive. Why has, in your view, um, this great gulf been fixed, uh, artificially, but nevertheless uh, fixed, between uh, uh, science and religion? Why, why is there so much opposition on the part of many people of faith uh, to science and also on the part of many scientists to faith? 
Yeah. Well, there's, uh, there, there's sort of two things going on, uh, one from each side. Uh, on the part of the Christians, I, I think many Christians have been kind of captured by a simple literalism when it comes to reading the scriptures. I mean, they kind of want to believe that God wrote the Bible in 21st century English for them and they can simply read it without worrying too much about the original languages and culture and so on. Uh, so I think that that's a part of it. That, that's, I think, a flawed hermeneutic mm -hmm. to kind of approach the Bible in that way. Um, but on the other side, uh, there are a lot of, uh, of secularists who are very eager for religion to go away. Uh, and it serves their purposes to use the prestige of science to kind of bash religion. And so there's a story that's been told that's, that's largely a fabrication about how throughout the history of science, every time there was a new idea, uh, the church came along and sort of in a sort of intellectual version of whack-a-mole tried to pound the idea back into the, uh, into the ground. And, then, and, that, and that's just not true that the church has always had that uh, response. And so it's easy to look at the confrontation today between evolution and creation, to take one example, and kind of extrapolate that back into history. But that's to kind of read into history something that's not there. We're going to continue this conversation tomorrow, friends, and I know you'll want to join us for that. The Wonder of the Universe is the book, Hints of God in Our Fine-Tuned World. This is a remarkable book, and it's available on the eStore. You can uh, access it by uh, logging on to crossroads.ca or calling 1-800-265-3100. And um, you'll be able to purchase your copy of The Wonder of the Universe. It'll be sent out to you ASAP. Uh, and it's, it's a remarkably stimulating reading. You're going to get a perspective that perhaps uh, uh, will certainly add value to your overall worldview. And I, I have absolutely abs uh, absorbed it. It's a terrific book. And I, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. So until then, the professor will be back with me, but let's, uh, let's go somewhere else.